it more slowly over and space them out more often. And on the average, the kidney function is actually better after chelation than it is before, on the average. Uh, but if it's given too fast and too, and in too high a dose or too close together, it can actually aggravate kidney disease. These are all things that, can, that any trained chelation doctor is well aware of and does the measurements of kidney function either both before and during the chelation therapy and regulates the dose. The benefit is the same for this reason. Even though you reduce the dose of EDTA, I compare it to pouring water in a bucket with a hole in the bottom, right? If you want to maintain a level of water high up in the bucket and it's got a little hole, you pour it in more slowly and it still stays high in the bucket. If it has a big hole in the bottom, you have to pour it in fast to maintain that level. Well, the hole is the kidney function, and the level is what bathes your cells. So we have a computer program, or you can do it manually, you don't need a computer, where you can, you can actually compute the dose of EDTA that's run in over a period of hours to maintain the blood level in all patients at about the same point. And the dose varies depending on uh, kidney function and body weight and, and other factors and we we put all those things into the formula and try to give everybody the dose of EDTA that keeps them keeps their cells bathed in the same level for the same period of time. You mentioned about iron toxicity. I always tell my patients that the worst multivitamin that they can get is one with iron and the Centrum brand that is so widely advertised in every drugstore try to caution everybody about that, uh, but that isn't exactly common knowledge in the mind. No, it's not. It is if they read my books. Uh, well, yeah. the, the question had to do with iron in multiple supplements. Iron accumulates with age. Uh, now, there are some people who need iron. It's essential. If, if you have iron deficiency, you have symptoms and you're not well. But unless you're bleeding, you're not iron deficient. Now, there are women before menopause who have heavy menstrual flow who actually need iron. You measure it and you give them enough iron to replenish them and no more. Are you just interested over the years? I don't think the schedule is important at all. It's a number of treatments. Uh, I've had patients come from overseas who get 30 treatments in 30 days. Of course, I measure their kidney function every day when I do that and make sure they have good kidneys. And, and, and I replenish the minerals. And... Uh, they do fine. I mean, I had, I had one guy come from Australia, had bad heart disease, and he got it that way, and he did great, got much better. And I've had other patients to get it once a month for 30 months, and it still works. But it works slower. My recommendation for prevention, oh, anybody over 40 years old, I'd say in the first year or so, get 20. And then, you know, probably five or six a year on an ongoing basis to maintain a good preventive program people with established advanced disease when they first come to me who have angina or, or documented heart disease or atherosclerosis, on the, on the average it takes 30 to get the optimum benefit. And then some of these people are quite sick and I say, well, you may want to come in once a month, get 10 or 12 a year on a maintenance basis. I tell them that's not necessary. I said, that's optimum and everybody's different. Some of my patients will say, well, if I go more than two or three weeks, my angina starts to come back, and I know when to come back in. Others get a series of treatments I don't see them for five years. And then they come back and say, I was well for five years, everything was great, and now they're starting to come back. It's a very individual thing. I think it's much wiser once you improve to maintain the improvement with a maintenance program than to wait for the disease to recur uh, because you might have a heart attack or something before you have a chance to, to get back into it. There's a certain amount of free radical going on. Yeah, the, the free radicals are, are one of the body's main defenses against infection. Uh, free radicals are not bad. It's just when they get out of control. It's just like the fire in the furnace in your home. It keeps your home warm, and, and every cell in the body has a little furnace, the factory that produces energy. And as long as it stays in the furnace and produces useful energy, Free radicals are often involved, and that's useful, and you want that to go on. But when the, 
when the f walls of the furnace start to break down and it threatens to burn down the house, then you have a problem. And that's the metaphor I use for free radical related disease with aging. The body's defenses break down. The antioxidant enzymes reduce. The, the, uh, I really believe that to a large extent the diseases and disabilities of age are deficiency states. The deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, trace elements, antioxidants, and hormones. There's a whole spectrum of hormones that goes down consistently with age that the body can't live without. Growth hormone, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone. Uh, I've written a book on this subject. Uh, there's an order blank in there if you're interested in it. Um, I'm not sure what's the most important, but I am certain that by replacing, re just giving replacement doses, partial replacement doses even of some of these hormones to bring them back to a more useful level are anti-aging. The recent data collected over the last 40 years shows that just replacing estrogen in postmenopausal women reduces the incidence of Alzheimer's disease 40 percent, reduces the death rate from all causes by 40 percent. From all causes, including cancer, death rates decrease 40 percent if you put cancer in with it. Now, the death rate from cardiovascular disease decreases 60 percent. So if women live longer and they don't die of heart attacks, maybe they live longer and they get, they're more likely to get cancer. That doesn't mean the hormone causes cancer. It means that you live longer and you don't die of the heart attack and cancer is what eventually gets you. You have to look at these statistics very closely. Estrogen does not cause cancer if it's given properly. You can deprive cancer of the female organs, of the breast. You can deprive breast cancer of estrogen and starve it for something it needs. Well, there's a big difference between saying hormone deficiency can starve the cancer and saying that the hormone causes the cancer. Because if you starve the cancer of something it needs, you're starving the whole body, and the whole body suffers. Same with men in prostate cancer. You can starve the prostate cancer of testosterone by castration, chemical or surgical castration, and by time. It goes into remission. That doesn't mean the testosterone causes the cancer. It means the prostate can't survive well without the testosterone. But the whole body needs testosterone. The brain can't function without testosterone. The human brain converts testosterone to estrogen in the brain, and it won't function without, it, without testosterone. So you pay a price for these deficiencies. Back here. are so much more effective than the three hours. Will you touch on that one? The question had to do with the 90-minute treatment being more effective than the three hours. Uh, the 90-minute 90, 90 treatments work, there's no question about it, and they work quite well. Uh, but you can only give half the dose. It's my belief that it probably works about 75% as well, and to give the full treatment works about 25% better. If my patients want to disconnect, after, I, I mix the full thing up. If they want to disconnect after the end of 90 minutes, they're welcome to. I haven't had any to volunteer to do that. <laughs> Um, most of the data here that's been gathered over the last 40 years is with the, with the full three-hour treatment, 50 milligrams per kilogram. There have been no studies comparing them, none, none whatsoever. One was studied that alleged to compare them, but they didn't measure blood flow. They measured blood pressure. Well, if blood pressure goes up with a 90-minute treatment, that doesn't mean that it has benefited any. A lot of my, pa a lot of my patients want their blood pressure to go down. <laughs> Uh, that was published in the Townsend Letter for Doctors, but it, it alleged to show that the 90-minute treatment worked, but if you read the data, it just showed that the blood pressure was a little higher after the short bottle. Uh, the Olzaware study in Brazil was done with lower doses over a shorter time. I don't question that it works. I just, I just think it works better to give it slower. The best results that were ever reported and, and uh, ever seen were done giving a 12-hour treatment. They, they gave the same dose, they just gave a three gram dose, but they'd put the patients in bed in a, in a like a quasi hospital, it was a motel, it was rented for this, and they start the bottle at night and they run it all night until the morning. And getting treatment, getting benefits better than I get, but I don't have many patients that want to spend 12 hours in my clinic and I don't want to spend 12 hours there with them. So I, 
I use three hours as kind of the point of diminishing returns. The first, the first hour and a half is by far the most important. The second hour and a half, I think, adds about 25% to it. Beyond that, I don't know. The ACAM protocol simply says you, if you give it in half the time, you can only give half the dose because to give the full dose in an hour and a half is too fast. It's toxic. So doctors and patients that want to get the lower dose in half the time have the option to do that. But nowhere in the protocol does it recommend that over the other dose. And nowhere in the protocol does it say it works as good. It does work. There's no question. There are people who would rather get less benefit and get out of there quicker because they have to come in in the middle of the day or something. They just get, you know, another, if they get 30 treatments with a short, short bottle, they get another five or 10 treatments at the end and they've got the same benefit. Some, patient, some people would like to do that. Yes? Yeah, how important do you think it is to use flax seed oil or fish oil to treat people with artery disease? Flax oil, the essential fatty acids in arterial disease, it's something you can add to the foundation we talked about before. You, you really need to have a broad spectrum, high potency, multiple vitamin as your foundation. Then you can add all these other things. Uh, the prostaglandins and the cell membrane uh, integrity can be improved with these things, there's no question. But uh, to put it in terms of in perspective with the other things and in terms of cost effectiveness, I would say that, that you add it later to the other things. By itself, it's not much. You add it to the foundation of the broad spectrum multiple mineral trace element vitamin antioxidant program, you get additional benefit. I use them myself, so that makes a statement. Some people can't afford all these things. And so I put things in order of cost effectiveness. This is the, le you'll get the most bang for the buck out of your multiple vitamin. You broad you, for $20 a month, you can get a good broad spectrum multiple vitamin without iron. It's got 40 other things in it, okay? $20, $25 a month or less. Then you can add extra C. I mean, this, what I'm talking about here is 1,100 milligrams of C, but you can add thousands of milligrams more. You can add another four, 800 units of vitamin E. You can add coenzyme Q10, pycnogenol, your essential fatty acids, cod liver oil, flaxseed oil, cold, liver, cold water fish oil, uh, uh, carnitine. Uh, there's a whole, whole long list of things you can add that do have potential additional benefit. Some I select. Patients with congestive heart failure, I always recommend carnitine. Patients that, who have heart function problems. I always increase their coenzyme Q10 to 300 milligrams a day if they can afford it, but it's more expensive. Coen at least 100, if they can afford the 300, go to 300. I tell, I tell my patients, do this before you get chelation. This is where you get your most cost-effective benefit. Then the chelation, add to it. The chelation will actually reverse the process. I think the supplements are more preventative. Carnitine, L-carnitine. There are two kinds of carnitine, uh, acetyl, acetylated, uh, acetyl L-carnitine, and uh, just carnitine. The acetyl L-carnitine works better for the brain, the nervous system, Alzheimer's, dementia, senility, that sort of thing. But it also works just as well for the heart. The L-carnitine is less expensive and works fine for the heart and for muscle, but it doesn't get into the brain as well. I take... I take acetyl L-carnitine myself every day, 1,000 milligrams, just on a preventive basis, but uh, I take, you know, phosphatidylserine and pycnogenol and all this stuff, you know, because I believe in it. And I don't mind taking a lot of pills, but if I told my patients to take all the pills I take, they'd freak out. <laughs> you know, first of all, they say they can't afford it. Some can. Some are real pill freaks. You know, they want all this stuff. Great. I tell them what I take. Well, the labels have a lot of, lot of filler in there that doesn't amount to much. The basic formula is in my book, Bypassing Bypass. It hasn't changed much over the years. If it's a one a day, it doesn't have much in it. One substance, one... It's one bottle, 180 tablets, three with breakfast, three with supper, or two with three meals a day, and you've covered the waterfront. That prevents imbalances. That prevents when you add the other things, it doesn't create an imbalance. It gives you the insurance amounts of everything. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a little break.